let's dive into GI function. GI is a big topic. As we all know, we learned this through the functional and nutritional programs. Harmful or imbalanced bacteria can lead to overweight or inability to lose weight. So there's a strong connection between the gut bacteria and bacteria and other cells that we have there and the function of other parts of our body. And we have more bacteria than we have cells in our bodies. At some point, when you look at all those studies on how those bacteria impact our function, it's hard to say if we're impacting them more or they're impacting us more. But the gut bacteria has several roles. For example, they prevent the colonization of pathogens such as E. coli. Immunologic effect, they, have, they protect and balance our immune system. They stimulate production of antibodies. For example, in immunoglobulin A is secreted uh, during allergic reaction and then promote anti-inflammatory cytokines and down regulates pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then regulating Tregs, the, the regulatory T cells, which are really, really important in immune uh, balance and because they suppress other immune cells and they prevent inflammation or autoimmune condition. If you have patients that have lower Tregs, right? They have lower Tregs. That's an opportunity for other inflammatory cytokines to, to increase. And there's also studies showing that if we express inflammatory cytokines more, it will reduce our Tregs as well. And, and, and it's with the immune system, it's all about balance. And so the gut bacteria is also important in metabolism in terms of absorption, altered gut bacteria composition, what this is what we refer to as dysbiosis, right? We have overgrowth of a certain bacteria that shouldn't be or losing some of our beneficial bacteria, right? It's associated with inflammatory diseases or infections. And studies have shown that supplementation with probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics may alter the secretion of hormones, neurotransmitters, and inflammatory factors. Probiotics, we all aware of it, is of, of what probiotic is, the bacteria, beneficial bacteria that we can buy as a supplement, concentrated supplement. But what are prebiotics? Well, prebiotics are the fiber that the probiotic bacteria will break down in order to create different metabolites and to allow them to grow and flourish in our gut. Symbiotic is a supplement that has both, right? You will have probiotics and prebiotics. And uh, there's several companies that manufacture such product. One of them is standard process. Other supplements will just add inulin, which is a fiber that will be functioning as prebiotic as well. In general, an exposure to harmful bacteria can happen from drinking water, contaminated food, eating raw or uncooked ground beef, medium rare hamburger, or from drinking raw milk. Small intestine bacterial overgrowth is a condition that occurs where there is excess bacteria or imbalance between beneficial or harmful bacteria. So remember, one important thing is that we have to consider is that we don't have to be exposing ourselves to bacteria from the exterior through food or water, contaminated food or water. We can also reduce the function or reduce the amount of the healthy bacteria through a stress reaction that reduces our immune function or through consumption of sugar, for example, that nourishes some of the harmful bacteria. For example, excess of the harmful bacteria and lower amount of the good bacteria is going to be leading to a, this, what we call a small intestine bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, or dysbiosis. Now, how would they identify that? Well, the clinical presentation is not always very straightforward. Now, with patients with diabetes, there is association with, uh, with those dysbiosis, complication of abdominal surgery, some autoimmune conditions, lupus, scleroderma, Crohn's, colitis, uh, certain drugs, narcotic, medication that decrease uh, acid in the stomach. Some medications slow down bowel movements, and that leads to overgrowth of bacteria because the way that our body eliminates excess bacteria is also through the feces and through the bowel movements. So we have to make sure that our patients always have healthy bowel movements. And of course, the use of antibiotics. With some patients, they will have symptoms that clearly will make us think about, oh, we need to 
order a comprehensive GI. They might have distension, constipation, loose stool, discomfort, and some patients might not, right? Some patients that we previously seen uh, had their symptoms start either right after a few weeks or a few months after they came back from other countries. And that's something that unfortunately happened to me when I came back from China. I had they started developing weird symptoms and I tested and uh, I found out that I had a gut bacteria. So it's really helpful to understand if the patient is coming from Middle East or India or Asia, or different places, and they started developing symptoms, then we want to look at their comprehensive GI. Of course, we mentioned that sugar could uh, decrease bacterial diversity, lead to abundance of bacterial, bacterial uh, deaths and abundance of proteobacteria. Proteobacteria is gram-negative bacteria, includes a variety of harmful pathogenic bacteria, such as Escheria, Salmonella, Vibrio, uh, H. pylori, Yersinia, and then complication of SIBO of those bacteria is they, they keep causing damage to the gut lining due, by producing waste product. They lead to poor absorption of nutrients such as fats, carbohydrates, protein, and fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K because some of those bacteria are capable of breaking down the bile that our gallbladder secretes, and then it prevents us or reduce our absorption of those fat-soluble nutrients. Of course, it can also lead to B12 or iron deficiency or folate deficiency and poor absorption of calcium, which might lead to a weaker bones or kidney stones. Uh, interesting study, 82 diabetic patients 75% of them were diagnosed with overgrowth or of harmful bacteria in their gut. So this is why I mentioned that some conditions are Crohn's, colitis, also IBS. Some of those conditions, diabetes, uh, we want to look into the gut because that would be, that would give us an indication of really what's happening there in that ecosystem. So comprehensive GI, we're going to look at a few of those. Uh, that would be comprehensive stool analysis, parasitology. You can do one day. You can do three days. This is going to be by doctor's data. Remember, there are other labs, but doctor's data giving us the, the information in a very simple way to, uh, to analyze and, and present to the patient as well. And then the collection is a stool sample, of course. So this is typically how it looks like, and we're going to dial deeper into it. So this is, for example, a 63-year-old patient suffering from several years of back and hips pain and inflammation. She had no digestion symptoms, which again, this is why I took this example, because this lady came to see us and she had no digestion symptom that might make us think about running a GI lab. But as we were working with her, she had her primary care doctor did not find anything. She tried physical therapy, chiropractic. We even did acupuncture in the clinic. Everything was very temporary relief until we decided to run a comprehensive GI on her, right? One of the reasons why I, when I saw her, I noticed that on her legs, she had those white uh, round patches that looked like a fungal uh, like a fungal infection. So I asked about her, about it, if she's seen a skin uh, specialist. She said that she didn't. She didn't think it was anything uh, special. So I told her, okay, we're going to send you to a skin uh, dermatologist, make sure that we overrule something dangerous. And then we're going to run the test with a comprehensive analysis for bacteria and fungi and looking at your metabolism and all of that. So this is what came back. Uh, you can see here on the left side, beneficial bacteria. She had really nice amounts. Plus four is a high level of amounts of bacteria. It's from zero to four plus. And so you can see that she had a really nice amount of those bacteria. Her diet was pretty good. She was eating lots of fermented food. She was cooking at home. So it was pretty clean diet. She had her own garden that she was uh, getting her, her, her vegetables from. But look at, her, look at the imbalanced flora. Those are typically, could be pathogenic or not, or bene, nor, nor pathogenic or beneficial, but when there is a tendency for, for inflammation, for example, eating the wrong foods or eating sugar, 
or if in the presence of this biotic uh, bacteria, such as the club Ciella on the right side, those bacteria could participate in the inflammatory process, right? And could flare up the, our immune system. What we mostly want to focus is always, do they have that dysbiotic uh, flora bacteria? And then looking, if they don't, then looking it into their imbalance bacteria. This is another patient, um, male patient, 29 years old with chronic inflammation, joint pain. You can see two things, imbalanced flora. He had gamma hemolytic uh, streptococcus, uh, four plus, that's a really high amount. And then dysbiotic flora, Citrobacter uh, coseri, which is also in a high amount. And that's the gamma hemolytic strep is a part of the streptococci family. We're gonna talk about it soon. So just to give you a little bit of interesting back, <clears throat> background from clinical reports, Klebsiella typically colonize human mucosal surfaces, such as the gastrointestinal tract. Hence the bacterium entered the body and it may present high degree of virulence and antibiotic resistance. In the general population, it was reported to have five to 30, 38% of the individuals carry their organism in their stool and one to six in their nasopharynx. Klebsiella is a pro-inflammatory bacteria that was reported uh, in an in vitro study to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, one of those studies were really interesting. They looked into uh, the, the renal, uh, the, um, um, the implication of the bacteria on eyesight and the retina. And they saw that through increasing pro-inflammatory um, pro -inflammatory cytokines, it could damage the retina. The infection is associated with underlying immunosuppressive conditions, such as patients with diabetes, HIV infection, in, in dwelling catheters, cardiac disease, renal insufficiency, malignancy, or in immunosuppressive therapy. Other bacteria that we saw with a 29-year-old patient, the Citrobacter coseri, is a gram-negative bacillus of the family Enterobacteriaceae. It was reported to play a role in a variety of diseases, processes, including urinary tract infections, pneumonia, bacteri bac bacteremia, as well as men meningitis and central nervous system abscess and sepsis in infant and immunocompromised host. So streptococci is classified as B hemolytic, uh, alpha hemolytic, and gamma hemolytic. And mucosal infection can cause uh, mucosal infection cause uh, mucosal immune abnormalities. Hemolytic streptococcus is one of the main pathogens of clinical upper respiratory tract infection. And this is why interesting. While this was not marked by the lab as a dysbiosis, it was marked as an imbalance pathogen that was found. Studies do show that it could lead to the secretion of interleukin-2, IL-22, stimulating the Th22 cells. And so studies reported that interleukin-22 expression is dysregulated in certain human diseases, right? Inflammatory conditions of the intestine, skin, and joints. An increase of IL-22 is associated with the reduction of the Treg cells. That you remember those cells that are really important in balancing our immune, immune function. And then animal study published by Xu et al. reported that streptococcus might aggravate inflammatory damage in chronic uh, ne uh, nephritis through the stimulation of those Th22 cells. So we'll have to address it and we'll show you a few of the treatment protocols. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the lab, what I really like about uh, doctor's data lab is that it will show you the sensitivity. And for example, with this bacteria, Citrobacter, it is going to be highly sensitive to grapeseed extract uh, and caprylic acid. And then on the bottom, there's different li lists of antibiotics. Uh, if, if that's a route that you're choosing to go, it will tell you exactly with which antibiotics are going to be more appropriate for, for the bacteria that was found uh, with this patient. Here's another one, a male, 70 years old uh, patient with chronic inflammation, had metabolic conditions. And again, you can see the alpha hemolytic streptococcus, gamma hemolytic streptococcus, 
Those were at three plus, which is again indicated on a higher amount. Those are some of the citations.